Some of the girls would tell us, who told you I wanted to be rescued? They put that wall because we are fighting them. You know how it is. If I push you, you have to push back. In most cases, I think people just look at, oh, is she going to school? Does she have uniform? Is there food? Uh, is there someone to pay the fee? Am I gaining as a person? Am I ticking the numbers of the girls that I'm saving? Then after that, they are good to go. But remember this girl has emotions and that's where we go wrong. That's where we miss the bigger picture. Counseling has to be healing that is actually led by you, only that it's facilitated by someone else. This is the NFG Podcast with Jedida Lemaron. Welcome to the End FGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I spend time with change makers who are making an impact in Kenya and beyond. Each week, we listen to incredible stories of ordinary people just like you making a difference. They share their successes, failures, and what they are learning along the way. Thank you for being with me today. Let's get started. On this cloudy day in Nairobi, we sit down to discuss counseling and psychosocial support in uh, ending FGM within our communities. And she is a counseling psychology uh, degree holder, I'd say, uh, from the University of Nairobi, and she runs an organization in Kajiado County, Malkia Initiative. And I have known her for a long time as Malkia Jedida. And today she's going to explain to us what she is doing. And as we start, why Malkia? Welcome to the End of Gym Podcast. Thank you very much. Um, why Malkia is because I believe every woman is a queen and every girl is a princess. And uh, for any princess to become a queen, then she has to be mentored and to be worked with. Uh, along this journey of life to become the best queen she can be. So that's why Malkia, of which Malkia is queen. Yes. That's queen in Swahili. Who is Malkia and where did this NFGM campaign journey begin? Um, so I am Jedida. Uh, so many people call me Malkia anyway. Um, born in Loitoktok, far down south. Um, then I think I stayed in Loitoktok Tok for the first five, six years. Then now moved to Kajiado, Kajiado, the headquarters, and went to um, public school. In Loitoktok, Tok, I used to go to a private school, I think unknowingly because I was young. But then when I get, came to AIC, I, could, I noticed the difference. First, that I was a different kind of Maasai girl. And this is because... I went straight into class one and in class one I was six, expecting every other girl to be six like the school that I was in. And I'm getting there and girls are 12 or older. And for me, that was the first thing that I think the, the first spark, why are these girls older? Then I think two weeks into class one, the teacher asked us to mention a three-lettered word. I said tap. The teacher came to me and said, I'm sorry, but these girls do not know what a tap is. I get emotional every time I talk about it because then today I know how sad it is for a girl who's 12 years old or at least 10, 6, not to understand what a tap is. But these were my people. Um, going through AIC primary school, it was a rescue center. And for me, my biggest issue with the girls was that one, they were older than me way much older so I think in my my little mind then I expected them to perform at least better than I did they they had so much privilege those days if you remember the tourist company Paulman's they used to they used to drive into our school every other minute and they'd come and whenever they come to school then the rescued girls would be called outside they would go they would sing then they'd get the small gifts, the sweets, the pens, and everything. And for me, I think every other girl in my class wanted to become a rescued girl because they had so much privilege. But then 
coming back to the education bit of it, these girls did not perform well in class. I can say not even, I think 99% of them did not perform well. They were always the last in class. And for me, I think it also brought so much questions like why? Then why? What did it feel like being in a class of girls who are now coming to school when they are quite old? Uh, what's the, what was the environment like? What's the experience like? I was very young, very naive, I think. And for them, I don't think they saw me from that bit of being a Maasai girl. Be- they, they thought that you are probably an outsider. Yes, they thought that I'm an outsider because I didn't say that the first day of school, my sister and I were talking English and we had a crowd of girls around us and they were looking at us like, Metokawapi. like, where are you from? Because who are these Maasai girls who are talking English? Because then in the community, I think that's not the language that people speak. But also being an uncircumcised girl was an issue because then I was seen as a kid. Yes, we are in the same class, but they saw me as a kid. And also because this is a rescue center, at times they would rescue girls who already had kids. So you can imagine the the disconnect just between us so yes there was a very big disconnect that's why we could not even sit with them and maybe just tell them can we read but those we tried and i think that is the other bit of now if jim probably would talk about some of the girls would tell us who told you i wanted to be rescued and as you are part of this group and this community of young people in this public school Uh, which also served as a rescue center. How did it feel like for you being viewed as an outsider, yet you still felt like you were supposed to be Maasai and uh, just a normal child in this situation? Um, How did it feel like for you? I honestly, I cannot say it felt like anything. But what I know today, now that I am all grown up, is that I thank God for my grandfather. God rest his soul, that even if I never met him, he is the reason why I am here today. It is, he is the reason that I am doing the work that I am doing today. My grandfather was born in a family of many boys, but he just happened to be the small-bodied and the weakest. In, you know how Maasai are. So he was sent to school because he was weak. And I think he was, he's the only one who went to school in his community, uh, he's in, in his family. And he is the only one that the family line now. I think we are the only one where like we've gotten so much education. As much as, yes, now different people are getting education, but you can clearly see the difference between my grandfather and my other grandfathers now from his brothers. You can, you can see the difference. And that's why, to me, then education is very important when it comes to the fight against FGM because we cannot, we cannot do this without education. I would have been one of those who were cut I would have been probably in a village today just sitting with my many children and my husband. But it's because of education that I am here today. And you pursued a degree in counseling psychology um, at the University of Nairobi. What drew you to that specific course? I knew I, I wanted to go back to the community. People would approach me, people that I don't know, to just talk to me. I knew I had that in me. And I knew that I wanted to go back and help people just understand themselves better. I, just before I did my, my degree in, in, in counseling psychology, I was working with some organization called Life Ministry. And in between that, I used to work with students. And I was, like the students would come with so many questions, so many problems, and I knew I wanted to do that professionally so that when I am giving them advice, rather when I'm talking to them, I'm just not giving them advice, but I can help when I can see when there are issues that are bigger than what I think, then I can be at a better place to help. So I think it was in tune with then going back to the community and helping the girls. How was it like from school to the community? 
it was very difficult. I was living in this Nairobi, you know, um, the great coffee, the great friends. Um, it was like everything is in one place. But then I had volunteered with a community of girls, uh, uh, young professionals who are doing great work in the community. And I think doing that, we were doing Kajado, Narok, actually just the Maasai communities. We would do a school in Narok. Next term we would do a school in Kajado. The next term we are in Samburu. Then I, there was no continuity and follow-up of the girls that we are reaching. And for me, I knew that I, I needed continuity. I needed to be in a place where I'd see a girl transition from primary school to high school and then to university and also become a woman and join us in this life. Um, so I knew I wanted to go back. So it was almost immediately actually because then I, I, my heart has always been in the community. I said I was working for Life Ministry, then uh, the Maasai professionals. Then I did a course with Akili Dada uh, on emerging leaders and I think that's when I just knew that I want to do this. I want to go back to my community. So it started with her name. I knew I just wanted to, to do something. And Malkia being my name, I was like, yes, Malkia Initiative Foundation. That came. Now we dropped the foundation. We are just Malkia Initiative across, I think, all platforms. But that's how it started. We did not register. We did not start with anything. It just started with her name and the passion. Then the rest followed. Now, you, you do not work with these girls in terms of um, rescue missions or going to the field and uh, actively, you know, um, taking these children into um, probably just telling them not to get cut. Do you do that? Having gone through AIC, the rescue center, my primary school, I felt that these girls are kept there and they are neglected, for lack of a better word. Because if these girls are in these rescue centers, if organization A rescued them and brought them to the center, then there is no follow-up. When a girl is brought to the rescue center, she is left there. Maybe she, she has a donor somewhere outside the country. Someone is paying for her school fees, full scholarship. But who follows up on the education? Who follows up on the well-being? the psychological well-being of this girl. So for me, that is my biggest issue. And many people do not really consider what the psychological well-being of these children, mm. because I'm assuming that or a child who is from the village just comes and joins other girls who are treated the same. Mm. I do not see the essence, probably from a layman's perspective, why this child should be treated in a way that is different from other children. Is it the case? You see, these girls, when they come from the community, one, they were rescued. At times it includes policemen with guns and racing cars. At times it includes the trauma of being cut. Sometimes it's just missing home. So when a girl is brought from the community to the school or to the center, the, she must be taken through counseling or just something for her to adjust to the situation that she is in and to even accept the situation that she is in. But in most cases, I think people just look at, oh, is she going to school? Does she have uniform? Um, does she have uniform? Is there food? Uh, is there someone to pay the fee? Am I gaining as a person? Am I taking the numbers of the girls that I'm saving? Then after that, they are good to go. But remember this girl has emotions and that's where we go wrong. That's where we miss the bigger picture. But we must agree that there are people do different things differently. You know, we can, some people are able to do the counseling and some people cannot do the counseling. They are good at rescuing. Yeah. You remember, like I said, these girls, when I was in school, these girls, very many people used to come to school to see these girls. What is happening to this girl? They are relieving the moment every day because I am sure if today we go into a rescue center with friends everyone wants to hear why the girls are in the rescue center for anyone to help even those donors they have to hear the sad story 
uh, how they were cut and everything. But you remember these girls are then reliving their life every day. They are recounting their, their experiences. Yes, every other day. So when the girls are in the rescue centers, they do not have anyone they look up to. And for me, it was get someone you look up to, get someone who has gone before you in life. Remember probably these girls are coming from a community where education is not really valid. And if education is not valued, then it means that probably no one in your home has actually maybe gotten to university. Not in all cases, but some, some they are the, actually the first ones to be in a school. So Malkia mentors, then the mentors stand there in that gap as big sisters. They are, most of them are university students or are early career professionals. So they stand there in the gap and they, we link them one-on-one -on -one with a girl so they mentor them they get to listen to them they get to advise them on daily things that they do in life uh, education wise and life skills so for us then we tell them that yes you were cut what can you do about it nothing can we then put it down and focus on education because only education is going to change your life and it doesn't have to be formal education don't get me wrong any education that is is going to change your life if you get skills then you can do one two three things and it will give you money it will open your mind because you see we also have to think of the economic bit of it so yeah uh Malkia mentors on the road we, we took uh the road to magadi it was interesting we had a couple of mentors and we visited four schools um, in Magadi, the problem is teenage pregnancy, so that is what we were addressing. But when you look at it, they are all interconnected. Because if a girl is, is cut, then she believes that she's a woman and she can have sex whenever. On the other hand, if a girl is not cut when she gets pregnant, then probably if she gets, um, if she delivers at home the um, bath attendant realizes that she's not cut then the culture says that the girl is to be cut the same day so we can never run away from fgm however way we we go to it so we went down we talked to them about education of course and life skills we talked to them about uh, real issues and that is i think one thing i love about the malkia mentors because we do not try to uh, to portray a face that is out of this world like our parents did that I was always number one you know we give them our life stories we tell them where we slept where we fell and how we got up and what they can do we are hoping to, to go back to Magadi and just follow up how we do it is we partner with a local organization or someone individuals from the ground who can also do the follow-up after we, we are gone before we go back again so I think it was a success and we're looking forward to getting on the road to more places Mentorship is a key component in um, bringing an end to you know, these vices because it also shows people what's possible. And, you know, because sometimes we, do not, we are not exposed enough to know what's possible. Is it possible for a woman, for example, to be you know, a leader in, in a community? So I agree with you in that, uh, in that aspect. But as you are doing this, I know you've had lots of sessions working with other organizations um, in counseling. How does that work? Counseling is interesting because you know in counseling we don't give advice and we don't read people's mind as people think. Counseling has to be healing that is actually led by you, only that it's facilitated by someone else. So at times you meet girls who do not want to open up to what they went through and you have to respect that. It takes time. It takes a lot of time before someone then feels very comfortable or before someone then starts the healing process but it's slow but we are sure by the end of the day that we are getting results we are seeing girls becoming more vibrant we are seeing them um, loving life more in terms of there's some girls who are withdrawn then you can see they're starting to make friends so uh, with the Malkia mentors we have more than three counseling psychologists within us. So it is something that we keep on doing. We do group group therapies or we do individual therapies depending. 
uh, there are some we see that this one cannot heal through a group therapy. So we decide then to go the individual where, where, where we link them to an individual counselor and they do the therapy together. So it is something, it is, it is a long run, but we are sure that we will win it at the end of the day. How does the counseling work if it's a self-led uh, you know, initiative? There's one thing that comes with counseling, trust. The thing that I realized when I started the Malkia Mentorship Program and why rescue centers is because I see that rescue centers are treated as museums. It means that Kipainoi today you'll walk into a rescue center, see the girls, bring them juice, biscuits, whatever it is, books, whatever you bring in, then leave. The chances that you'll go back to that rescue center is close to zero. What we are doing with the girls is that we are doing workshops every holiday where we are there they see our faces we go visit them during midterm we write letters to each other we form a relationship a bond and it's with this bond that these girls then get to trust us so if we are very close whatever relation human relation that is if you're close to someone you're just due to open up to them so that is why it's very easy for us, for the girls to open up to us. Most of our, uh, of our programs that we implement are in sexual reproductive health and rights. So you find that most of the time we might just start talking about menstruation, which I am, I think very many people know me on that side. And when we start talking about menstruation, then we will, we will talk about the human anatomy, the body and everything. And then at some point, Within the talk, someone will start talking about how she, how a boy probably lied to her about something. And you would be surprised how these talks just take a very detours, you know, like they just take detours and we end up talking about things that probably they happened to them. Um, the other bit about counseling, then it's confidential, so I cannot tell you different stories, but. You just get to hear things that the, the girls would have never told anyone else. They will even tell you, you rather you'd even know if something is wrong with them that day because you know them so well that you would know when one is quiet. Uh, you know like you'd get to know everyone with their temperaments and uh, how they are. So it's interesting but quite, quite good. And it's very interesting that you are able to sit down in the... Uh, it is interesting that you are able to sit down with girls from uh, different parts of Maasai land, as I'd say. You can only create a bond with as many girls. How do you keep that accountability among yourselves as mentors who would like to create a bond with these children from different um, parts of uh, Maasai land? The interesting part about all the mentors that I have is that when we started, it was an online application, so I put it out. Um, the, whoever wants to apply for this position as a mentor, then they'd apply. M some of them dropped out somewhere along the road. But I'm telling you for a fact that no one who came down to the rescue center ever dropped. I've had some of my mentors tell me that, JD, we did not know that FGM is a real thing until we came to this center. We thought that those celebrities just um, promote it because of the money bit of it. But all of them who come down to the rescue center form such a bond with the girls that if I have not posted the next date for the next visit, they are the ones who now push me to tell them when are we visiting the girls again even when we are having just normal conversations because even for me then I developed a bond with every of the mentor and they'd ask me how are the girls doing how is my mentee doing because then they are attached to girls and it's something that is from deep within them so for us it's now a family it's it's not just um, mentorship or just counseling 
it's it's more than that it's a family it's a bond that we've created and i believe when you are attached to something it's very difficult for you to leave it so now we're expanding doors we are moving to different rescue centers uh, we've already started we've done i think uh, one year We've already finished our one complete year in one rescue center and it was very good. Now we are in our second rescue center in our second year. And you can, I can tell you for a fact that every time we finish our workshop, every holiday, the girls cry. Can you just extend for one more day? But then you know after one more day, they'll still say one more day. So it's interesting. But we believe that these girls, they will make such an impact. And for us, it's for the girls to come back and pay it forward for the younger sisters that are coming and it will not end with us. We have so much to talk about, but I'd like to know how it's been like for you in terms of relating to the people who are the custodians of these children. Um, how are you able to approach these people as our teachers, you know, um, giving you um, an easy time to, while speaking to these young girls, uh, local authorities, how are you working with them? It's interesting. I'll start with the local authorities. I think that was the gap that was needed. I was talking recently to the, um, to the, I think the, the, it's not the chair, um, the person in charge of children's department in Kajiado, and we were just talking, and also a children's officer, and we were just talking about the gap that we have in mentorship, and they were really happy that I am doing that. And I think it's very, it's very good. They're open to it. I think it has not been happening so now that we are doing it. They are at peace. They are, more, they are happy that we are doing it. And they know, of course, it's for the betterment of the children. The teachers, I think they're also getting it. They're, they're getting what we're doing and they've seen change. Even when, it's funny because uh, in one rescue center, even when one child is not cooperating, then whenever I go to the school, they're telling me, and talk to, you know, ex-girl, because now she is not as she was. So I was like, hmm, I am almost like the parent that they are reporting the girls to me. Um, the parents or the community at large, it's a, it's a journey that we have to walk. We must accept that FGM is still there and it will take time but it it also depends with us who are out here the activists the advocates the lawmakers and everything first the approach that was there uh, on fgm in the hotspot counties was wrong because then we were fighting the community we said fgm is wrong they they were born into it so who said fgm is wrong I, I keep on telling people that if today I woke up in the morning and told you not to brush your teeth again, ever, will you stop? So it is the same thing. When we walk into these communities and tell them that FGM is wrong, then we should then think of it as the normal things that we are used to doing. So for me, I have always called for us to going back to the drawing board and see where the rain beat us and to be friends with these communities because then it's only then that we can have conversations with them. I believe in community dialogues. Let's talk with them. Let us understand why they keep on doing it because I've had so many theories but none of them actually works for me because things are changing and we're still doing the same thing. So. My thinking is, let's be friends with the community. I believe that many parents actually take their girls through FGM because of love. They know that if they don't cut them, probably they won't get husbands. And I don't think there's any woman who wants their kids not to get husbands. So they don't do it because they hate these girls. They don't do it because it's a punishment. They do it because they think that it is a good thing. So how can we talk to these parents for them to understand what we say is wrong is then wrong because if we fight with them at times they know it's wrong but they put a block they put that wall because we are fighting them you know how it is if i push you you have to push back so there's no need we are, we, we we i think so many girls are are at a risk of uh going through fgm i think we are at four million now per year 
I don't think we need to have like more numbers. We like to bring this to a close, but before I let you go, I'd, 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 I'd be happy to hear uh, probably if, if you had something you know, to share with someone who wants to begin uh, working uh, with communities in whatever um, capacity as a psychologist or a, a counselor or maybe they want to use communications or you know, their careers in trying to help these communities. What piece of advice would you give to such a person? It's not a bed of roses out here. So there's this perception that if you're doing any NGO, CBO, any uh, work, kind of like the, the kind of work we do is we are out here for the money or there's so much money out here. Truth is there's no money. Truth is if you do not have a passion, you'll close doors after a month or two. So... Do this because you want to do it. Do this because you really are passionate about it. Do this because you want to better the life of some people out here. And yeah, just do it. You have to start at the end of the day. So start. We are out here. We are going to support each other. We work together. And at the end of the day, we will achieve what we want. So whoever is out here, come. Let's, let's uh, I think... Tukishikana mikono tukiwa wengi ndiyo tutaweza kufanya kazi. Swahili popped in. That was uh, Jedida Lemaron. She is the executive director of Malkia Initiative uh, in Kajedo County. And before we just leave right now, uh, Jedida, I'd like you to just share a way people would reach out to you, probably a Twitter or, uh, or email that someone would be able to reach out to you. Uh, in case they would like to come and probably volunteer or work with you or support you or probably just get a sit down and talk about what you people are doing in Kajiado and probably how they could ship you? Um, my, my Facebook name is Jedida Malkia Lemaron. Our organization uh, Facebook page is uh, Mal the Malkia Initiative Foundation. We are on Twitter at M, -I -M underscore I Foundation. Instagram Malkia Initiative. Um, our email address is info at malkiainitiative.org. My personal email is jd at malkiainitiative.org. Um, come, let's work together. Let's change the girls one at a time. We are making lives count at the Malkia Initiative. Jedida Lemaron, uh, Malkia Initiative, Kajedo County. Thank you very much for joining me here today. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I've learned a lot. And one takeaway for me today is never leaving someone just assuming that they are okay in these children's home or rescue centers or just when we have a rescue case, then it's important to do follow-up and try to find out about the well-being of these children. So thank you very much for coming over to the NFTM podcast. This podcast is hosted by me, Jeremiah Kipainoi, and with our team, uh, Tony Mwebia and Matilda Timpian. We thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Till next Monday, take care. You can get bonus materials, notes, and much more at www.kipainoi.com. K-I-P-A-I-N-O-I dot com. Please remember, we all can do something. Go out and make a difference. For we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. Goodbye.